Tier list, a way to adequately sort a random set of anything, as well as an easy to swallow format for audiences across the internet. The information super highway, baby. And as a huge fan of everyone's favorite supervillain, I thought I'd go over my preferential ranking of MF Doom's discography. For this list, however, I will only be ranking Doom's full-length studio albums, as it wouldn't feel fair to rank an instrumental album or a short two-song EP alongside a core album like Mad Villainy. I will, however, speak briefly on every release before diving into my placement of each core album. And for anyone who's interested in creating their own tier list, I've left you a link in the description below. And as always, if you appreciate my effort, do me a favor by leaving a like on this video. I'll try to keep each segment short and concise. This video isn't meant to be an in-depth review of these albums. In the future, however, I would like to make a more in-depth analysis for each of these albums. So if that's something you're interested in, be sure to subscribe for when those videos do come out. And without further ado, I'd like to begin by identifying the projects that I won't be sorting. If you just care about the core album placements, you can skip over to this timestamp. Starting off with the EPs, these include the Bookhead EP, the Occult Hymn, Unicron, which apparently I've been pronouncing as Unicorn this whole time, Westside Doom, DJ Muggs X Doom, Victory Laps, and the MF EP. Most of these EPs are made up of remix songs from their older brothers, and usually only feature a couple tracks worth of new material, so judging these projects alongside of Born Like This is a bit lopsided. Most of these projects are mainly composed of leftovers, meant to supplement their full-length counterpart. Speaking of leftovers, I'll also throw in mm, leftovers into this category. This was a promotional product, which as the title implies, was leftovers from mm, food. It shares many characteristics with the typical EP, despite never getting a commercial release since it was meant to be used as a promotional item. It's similar to the Because the Internet's Hacks flash drive. While we're at it, I'll also throw in Mad Villain's Unloved Child, Mad Villainy 2, the Mad Lib remix into this category. As the title declares, this is simply a remix of the original Mad Villainy, with a few alternate verses from Doom and alternate beat selection from Mad Lib. Moving on from the EPs, we have the KMD albums, which will also not be included in this ranking. And that's because these albums existed at a time where Daniel Dumoulin was not yet the villainous MF Doom that we would come to know. Instead, Dumoulin went by Zevlov X in the crew KMD, which was a completely different era in Dumoulin's life. Throughout Doom's career, we were given two live albums, Live from Planet X, which has one of the most gorgeous artworks in Doom's discography, and Expectoriation. Obviously, I won't be ranking these live albums because they're just that, albums which are composed of pre-existing material which Doom perform live. I won't be ranking any of the Special Herb albums since they're just instrumentals that feature no rapping, but as we all know, these instrumentals are absolutely amazing and definitely worth a listen. Rounding out the list, there's a couple of albums that I would deem as miscellaneous. These albums both exhibit and lack traits of what I'm considering as an official Doom album. For example, we have Unexpected Guest, which is an official full-length commercial release, but it's a compilation album composed of previously released material. Master Ace's Son of Yvonne utilizes Doom's special herb instrumentals across the entire project. Despite this, however, Doom did not directly collaborate with Master Ace on this album, aside from giving him his blessings to use the beats, as well as one vocal appearance on the track, Think I Am. Boom. Hit shot. Even less can be said for Monster Island's Art's Escape from Monster Island, which did have Doom produce a few tracks and make a single vocal appearance as King Ghidra, but that's about it. <gasps> and again, I feel the need to emphasize that these aren't by any means bad albums. In fact, I think they're quite enjoyable. I just don't think it makes sense to rank them alongside the core Doom albums, and that goes for all the records that I'm not including in this particular ranking. The last album that I won't be including is the one I'm most torn about. It's Adult Swim and Doom's The Missing Notebook Rhymes, a project which I talked at length about in multiple videos, and admittedly, I have a bit of a soft spot for it. Not because it's particularly underrated or underappreciated, but just because of the unfulfilled potential of this project. 15 all new Doom bangers dropping every week. And as much as I'd like to include it, I simply can't due to its multiple glaring issues. For one, this project never got a true official release. You won't find this project on the Gastral's website, and you sure as hell won't find it on any streaming service aside from SoundCloud. On top of that, as we all know, The Missing Notebook Rhymes was cancelled before all the tracks were properly released. However, as I explored in my previous video on this subject, there exists the Metal Face SoundCloud page, which is speculated to host the remaining Notebook songs. Keeping that in mind, if I were to rank The Missing Notebook Rhymes, I'd either be ranking an unfinished project, or a project half composed of songs that haven't even been confirmed as the original Notebook Rhymes. It's just a really messy situation overall, so unfortunately I won't be including it here. With that being said, I still recommend giving the project a listen if you're fixing for some more Doom music. 
And that wraps up the projects I won't be including. Thank you for watching this intro segment since it's kind of important to me to differentiate between the albums I won't be including and will be including. The rebels who skipped this part of the video will now be joining us. This message is for them, not for you. Alright, you suck for skipping, but now we can move on to the albums I will be ranking. I'll try to keep this chart as simple as possible with four rows. S, the A, Rhymes like Tom, B, Still dope. and C tier. The back end sucks. And just so we're clear, this video isn't meant to be some sort of arbiter to Doom's discography. All placements are based on my personal enjoyment and are highly subjective. So I encourage you to leave a comment of your own placement for these albums. I figured a good place to begin would be where it all started, with MF Doom's debut, Operation Doomsday. Released in 1999, Doom's debut marks his first appearance on a full-length album since KMD's Mr. Hood. Technically, Black Bastards was recorded between the release of Mr. Hood and Doomsday, however KMD's sophomore album wouldn't see the light of day till the year 2000, when a commercial release was financed by Doom's longtime friend, MF Grimm. Operation Doomsday was entirely self-produced by MF himself. The album also introduces us to the character of MF Doom, Metal Fingers, and King Ghidra. Many Doomheads hold this album as one of Doom's least villainous appearances, which is arguably true. Seeing as this was Doom's first project under the MF Doom moniker, but I don't really care about the whole persona nearly as much as I care about how good the actual music is, and Doomsday throughout its runtime is extremely consistent in terms of quality. Tracks like Dead Bent, Hay, Red and Gold, and Gas Draws are some serious highlights for me, and that's not even mentioning beloved fan favorites like Rhymes Like Dimes or Doomsday. Operation Doomsday is a strong A tier album for me. A lot of fans seem to put a lot of stock into the villain angle Doom would later lean heavily into. For me, I've always viewed it as a creative identity and a branding tool, but never something to be taken so seriously. At least not as serious as some Doom fans seem to take it. Jumping ahead to 2012, we were introduced to a new collaborative pseudonym known as JJ Doom, composed of producer Gennaro Jarrell with Doom handling the mic. As many of my loyal viewers here on the channel know, I find this album to be incredibly overlooked. Not underrated, but definitely underappreciated. It's easily one of Doom's least accessible albums. Key to the Cups was an album that came out after Doom was denied re-entry into the United States, and exiled to his home country, like a real villain. Speaking of exile, my favorite track on this record is definitely Banished. Jarrell's production on this track is phenomenal. I love all the warp sounds he uses, it sounds so eclectic, but still pleasant to listen to. And if there was any artist capable of rapping on such a unique beat, it'd be our favorite supervillain. And Doom does not disappoint, coming in with a flow and speed to match the rhythm of this otherworldly instrumental. I also like the way the ending bit of the intro track Waterlogged references the subsequent song Governor. Hey, governor. <laughs> governor. Even tracks like Dog Friendly, which feature no vocal appearances by Doom, are pretty good. With that being said, Key to the Cups has all the hallmarks of a good Doom album, but something about it just feels a little watered down. I can't really put my finger on it, I just feel like this album doesn't have its own accordion or rap snitches or rhymes like dimes. The highlight track off this album for most would be Governor. Hello, Governor. And while I do like the song, I don't feel the same type of connection like I do with other Doom songs, even with the regular show sample. Pay the fare, or pay the price. No, dude. Is it as bad as people say? I don't think so. It might not be Doom's best work, but it's certainly not bad. I'd place it in the B tier. For me, the definitive version of this album is Key to the Cuff's Butter Edition, which features all the contents from the original album, as well as the songs from the Bookhead EP. For those of you looking to re-listen to this album or maybe give it another shot, the Butter Edition is the way to go. The track Bookhead is Doom in peak form, and The Signs is another great Jarrell centric song like Dog Friendly. Released in 2004, Mad Villainy is easily Doom's most recognizable and celebrated album. Over the years it's proven itself as an influential and timeless classic. It was released under the guidance of independent record label Stone's Throw, which brought together rapper MF Doom and producer Mad Lib to create the infamous duo of Mad Villain. But don't let that fool you, Lib does make lyrical appearances on the track Shadows of Tomorrow and America's Most Blunted, under his alias of Quasimodo. Doom also receives credit in part for the production on the opening track, The Illest Villains, an intro which sets the stage for the dastardly duo before dropping you right into fan favorites like Accordion and Meat Grinder. My personal favorites are Great Day, Figaro, and Rhinestone Cowboy. This album is nothing short of lightning in a bottle, and I'd feel weird to put it anywhere else besides S tier. The Mouse and the Mask is a 2005 collaborative album released by Danger Doom. 
a duo which consisted of MF Doom and producer Danger Mouse. Much like Operation Doomsday, in terms of quality, this album is very consistent throughout its entire runtime. I'd say my favorite songs off this album are Vats of Urine, Perfect Hair, and Space Hose, or Benzy Box. So many of the songs on this album are so on par with one another in terms of quality that it's kinda hard for me to pick a favorite, but if I had to, it'd probably be between those. Nearly every song in this album features some sort of Adult Swim reference, skit, or sample. One of my favorite references is off El Chupanibre, where Doom says, The fact that Doom knows anything about Inuasha is both hilarious and fascinating to me. While the average rapper references Dragon Ball Z or Naruto, Doom is out here talking about Inuasha. It's a 2000s anime that only the supposed weird kid in your class would have known about back in the day. And yet, Doom champions that kind of outsider culture. A wise man once said, do you. A lot of people criticize how encompassing the Adult Swim theme is throughout the album. Personally, I don't really mind it too much. The album is supposed to be Adult Swim themed, which the opening line off the album states. Adult Swim presents Danger Doom. My only issue with the skits and samples is that some of them go on for a little longer than I feel they should, causing the album to feel congested at times. Many of these skits could have easily been cut by like 20 seconds, and it would have given the album a much better flow from track to track. For example, on The Mass, the track could have ended here at 2 minutes and 43 seconds, but then it goes on for another 29 seconds. A perfect example of skit usage is on Space Hose, where the intro skit is concise and also ties into the song's theme. And I especially like how the characters are tied in through the lyrics, appearing as ad-libs when lyrics pertaining to them are brought up. Way back used to rub thorax and borax. Overall, The Mouse and the Mask is a fun album that doesn't take itself too seriously while also providing some great lyrical content from Doom. I'd put this album in the A tier behind Operation Doomsday. Venomous Villain was the second and last full-length album revolving around Doom's persona of Victor Vaughn. The album is pretty overlooked, but for good reason. Despite my characterization of this album as full-length, the album is quite lacking in terms of actual content. The album runs for a little over 35 minutes, but Vaughn only raps for about 10 of those minutes, with the rest of the album being relegated to features and skits. I'd still recommend this album to listeners just because I'm sure you'll find an instrumental feature or doom verse that you'll really enjoy. For me, this would come in the form of the song Titty Fat, where Vic plays around with just two rhyme schemes for the entire verse, or Karo Kevorkian's feature on Dope Skill, where he mentions starting a bidding war among record companies for his music only to end up releasing it independently, something which Frank Ocean would essentially do over 10 years later. To me, that line also describes Doom's approach to the music industry almost perfectly, but that's a video for another time. I'd place Venomous Villain in the C tier. It's not a terrible listen or anything, it's just really lacking in terms of actual Doom content. And that's a commonality you'll find across all the albums placed in the C tier. What a beautiful ring. Villainous Rings and Pendants of Doom are now back in stock. Orders placed before next Monday the 21st are expected to arrive before Christmas. All orders placed after the 20th are not guaranteed to arrive in time for the holidays. A lot of people ask me, absurd, how do you keep your face so smooth? Well, my dear viewers, I use the Manscaped line of products. I would never feature a sponsorship on my channel for a product that I don't personally use or condone. Luckily, the good people on Manscaped were kind enough to send me their performance package, which is an all-in-one grooming kit. It features tools such as the Lawnmower 4.0, which you can use in the shower since it's a waterproof and cordless shimmer. Plus, it can be used anywhere on your body thanks to its ceramic blades with skin-safe technology, made to help reduce nicks and cuts. On top of that, if you travel a lot, you can bring the shimmer wherever you go thanks to its wireless charging dock and travel safe feature. Also included in the package are both the Crop Preserver Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Toner Spray, two excellent products to add to your post shower routine. My personal favorite product included in this performance package is the Weed Whacker, perfect for trimming nose hairs. And just like the Lawn Mower, the Weed Whacker is waterproof and cordless with the same skin safe technology. And for a limited time, Manscaped is throwing in two free gifts with your order a pair of their anti-chafing boxer briefs, and the Shed Travel Bag. So if this package is something you're interested in, go over to manscaped.com and use promo code ABSURD for 20% off plus free shipping and your two free gifts. Special thank you to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. And now back to the tier list. Take Me To Your Leader sees Doom take on the character of King Ghidorah. Ghidorah, or Ghidra as Doom pronounces it, is a recurring antagonist throughout Toho's Godzilla franchise, maintaining with the villain theme but from the perspective of a different bad guy, keeping the whole theme fresh and unique but still familiar enough. Speaking of which, Ghidra's character is one which we've seen appear on previous works, but only in 2003 that he finally takes center stage on his very own full-length album. In the same way food is the theme of mm, food, giant monsters are the theme of leader. 
Being covered from front to back in giant monster references and samples, with sound collage tracks layered perfectly across the album. I say perfectly because despite Ghidra only showing up for 5 out of the 13 songs, the album doesn't feel all that lacking, and that's due to the way the tracks are laid out. The album is put together in such a way that you get an even dose of doom, features, and samples, giving the album a more rounded and grandiose feel, much like a real movie. As soon as you're getting tired of a certain feature, Ghidra pops up, and before he can overstay his welcome, you get a sample collage as a palette cleanser. Long stretches of samples being relegated to entire songs is something which albums like The Mouse in the Mask and All My Heroes would have greatly benefited from. Out of the entire album, my favorite songs would be Antimatter, No Snakes Alive, and The Final Hour. I feel like a lot of people wouldn't consider this an essential Doom album, but it's definitely a personal favorite of mine. I'd place it in the A tier. Released in 2014, Neruvian Doom was a collaborative project between MF Doom and Bishop Neru, a much less celebrated album in Doom's catalog, as unlike many other collabs, Doom takes a backseat on this album to handle the production, leaving center stage to newcomer, Bishop Neru, who was only a remarkable 18 years old at the time of this album's release. Unfortunately, I think Bishop's inexperience at the time was to this album's detriment. Neru is undoubtedly a talented MC, I just think it would have been far more interesting for Doom to have worked with a different up-and-coming rapper at that time, someone like a Joey Badass or an Earl Sweatshirt, even someone a little bit older and more experienced like a Childish Gambino or a Blue. Regardless, Bishop shines through delivering some quality bars on my favorite songs, Ohm and Caskets. Another thing that I absolutely love off this album is the phenomenal skit and production choices, courtesy of Metal Fingers. Starting with the skits, I like them because they work perfectly in tying the whole mentor theme the duo have going on, with talks of meditation, thriving during times of hardship, and letting go of other people's perceptions of you, choosing not to care what people think of you. Personally, I really dislike a lot of the hooks on this album. Maybe it's because hooks aren't really a staple across Doom's discography, but also in general I've grown to really appreciate songs that don't utilize a chorus. Don't get me wrong, Means the Most and Great Things are still okay songs, they're just not ones that I come back to very often. Except maybe the song Coming For You, that would be the exception for me. Regardless, the instrumental on all these tracks are fantastic, Doom absolutely killed it with the production across the album. It makes me wish we would have gotten one more solo Doom album where he handles the production almost entirely. Overall, the two clearly have great synergy together, and I would have loved to have received a follow up album or EP with an older and more experienced Nauru. I'd place Neruvian Doom in the B tier. It's not the best or the worst, but it certainly has some highlights for me. Zarface Meets Metal Face is one of the final MF Doom albums to have been released, dropping back in 2018. It's a collaborative album between MF Doom and rap supergroup Zarface, which is composed of duo 7L and Esoteric, as well as Wu-Tang's Inspect the Deck. I'm not really the biggest fan of Zarface or this album. For one, I feel Zarface just sort of ripped the whole comic book villain aesthetic from MF Doom, but failed to make the lore anywhere near as interesting or creative. Which is kind of disappointing when you consider Zarface is composed of multiple talented artists, while on the other hand, Daniel Dumoulin is only one mind, and still managed to craft some of the most imaginative and creative albums in all of music. And if there's one thing I appreciate more than anything about MF Doom, it's his immense creativity and his ability to think outside of conventional norms, something which I don't really see or get out of Zarface. It's not the 90s anymore, I expect a little more than just mean bars from an artist, and especially from a creative like Doom. But that's more of a personal gripe that I have with Zarface, so I can overlook it. What truly bothers me about this album more than anything is the lack of theme. This is supposed to be a grandiose moment, it's Zarface meeting Metal Face. For the great concept that this album is, it really lacks character. Unlike albums such as Take Me To Your Leader, The Mouse and the Mask, Mmm Food, literally any other Doom album. Hell, even Key To The Cuffs has more of a theme than this album. The biggest highlights for me are moments like the skit track Close Talkers, which sees the characters of MF Doom and Zarface actually interacting. Another thing that I can appreciate from this album is the amazing cover art. Unfortunately, the contents of the album don't really live up to the fun comic book aesthetic that the cover portrays, but whatever. I still have a couple of standout tracks. Astral Traveling, Bomb Throne, and Stun Gun are all great songs. I love the instrumental work on Bomb Throne and Stun Gun especially. It sounds like something off a special Herbs album, totally up Doom's alley. Unfortunately, he's only on that song for these sort of interludes between verses, but they're pretty good for what they are. And I really appreciate the references to previous Doom songs. And luckily for us, 7L's production for this song doesn't go to waste either, since Esoteric comes through with a great set of verses. The only thing keeping this album going for me are the decent bars, but like I said, it's not the 90s anymore, and I expect a little more than just good bars. But again, there are standout tracks, like I mentioned. 
I feel like this lack of theme but still really good rap would work better for a short EP as opposed to a 16 track album. I'd place this album in the C tier. This album just lacks a lot of the hallmarks of what makes a Doom album so good. This record feels more like a Zarface album featuring MF Doom than a true collaboration. Released in 2009 between The Mouse and the Mask and Key to the Cuffs, Born Like This marks the final solo Doom album we would receive before Doom Ali's passing. Born Like This is kind of the oddball of the solo MF Doom albums. It has a much darker and dreary tone to it than Doom's other solo projects. Don't get me wrong, both Operation Doomsday and M Food do handle more serious subject matter, but that pales in comparison to Born Like This. Further driving this distinction in tone is the fact that Doom drops the MF from his name for this album, leaving his moniker as simply Doom. It's never really elaborated on, nor does he come back to using the moniker, so it's kind of a self-contained thing. It might have had something to do with the tension between him and Grimm at the time, but I prefer not to look at it that way since it's not nearly as interesting. Born Like This features production from the GOAT Madlib, Jay Dilla, Jake One, Mr. Top, and in typical solo Doom album fashion, a couple of self-produced tracks by Metal Fingers. I actually wish more of the album would have been produced by Doom since my favorite songs off the album are the Metal Finger produced ones. Tracks like That's That, Cells, and even the controversial Bothy Boys have some excellent and interesting production. I mean, what other rapper would take on the task of rapping over an instrumental like the one featured on That's That? And the track Cells features what I'd consider Doom rapping in top form. I'd put it up there with songs like Bookhead and Figaro. The song also opened with a reading by Charles Bukowski of his poem Born Into This. The poem paints a terribly bleak and hopeless outlook of civilization, perfectly encompassing the theme of this album. Which makes sense seeing as the title of Born Like This is lifted off Bukowski's poem, and you could really see that Doom took inspiration from it here on this album. Speaking of dark, the song Bati Boys, despite its horrible lyrics, does provide some pretty good production. If I had to nitpick something, I'd say I don't really like the TV and movie samples used throughout the album. I much prefer the ones on his previous solo works, but I think the samples used on Born Like This certainly fit its darker tone. I'd recommend this as one of the final Doom albums to listen to when going through his entire discography. In general, Born Like This might not be Doom's best, but it's certainly Doom at its most villainous, and I can see why it receives a lot of fanfare. It's not to be overlooked, I'd place it at the very top of B tier. Um Food is the second solo MF Doom album. Released in November of 2005, this album features Doom really having honed his character, production, lyricism, and everything else he's learned over the past few albums, and puts all that insight and experience to work, creating Um Food, which is easily one of Doom's best and most accessible projects. True to its title, every song in this album references food or something relating to food. The album opens with Beef Rap, one of the most iconic songs in all of Doom's discography. From everything that I've mentioned in this video thus far, you'd probably assume I disliked the nearly two minutes worth of samples, but unlike the mouse in the mask, Um Food cleverly places this at the very beginning of the album, serving as the album's intro, and I absolutely love it. The way it references Operation Doomsday, reminding fans that this album is the follow-up to it, is absolutely genius. I also appreciate how the majority of skits are relegated to their respective tracks, instead of cluttering other songs, and all the skits that are featured on a normal song seem really fitting. The album of course features the iconic rap snitches featuring Mr. Fantastic, and the song Potholders with the great Count Basty, which has to be one of the grimiest tracks of Doom's entire discography. In terms of production, Metal Fingers does most of the heavy lifting, but we're also treated to songs produced by both Madlib and Count Basty. The Count on Potholders and Madlib on the track One Beer, which was originally planned to be on Mad Villainy. Besides the music itself, the album's cover is an iconic work of art. If you ever want to gauge how successful an album cover is, you can usually tell by how often it's recreated and parodied. As for my favorite songs off this album, they include Deep Fried Friends and Con Carne. Deep Fried Friends is a genius dissection on the concept of friendship. It's a song with a lot of wisdom attached to it, and it really made me think and reevaluate who I consider a friend. On the other hand, Concarne was one of my first favorite Doom tracks. I remember the exact time and place, the weather, and the mood I was in when the song really grabbed my attention. I especially love the instrumental laid out throughout the song, which Doom complements beautifully with his verses. 
For me, the song has a really somber feel to it, but maybe that has more to do with how I was feeling personally when first discovering the song. Although the track is a dedication to Doom's brother Subrock, so maybe there is an inherent melancholic quality to it. And the closer track, Cookies, is a hilarious song, one of my favorite closers on any Doom album. Overall, Mmm Food is a fantastic concept album and a great listen overall. Despite it being 15 tracks, the album never loses focus and it's a pleasant experience to listen to this record, easily an S tier album. Now, whether you put it above Mad Villainy is total preference. They're completely interchangeable, in my opinion, in terms of being Doom's best album. Sometimes I prefer Mad Villainy, sometimes I prefer Mmm Food. Right now, I think I have a bit of a lean towards Mmm Food, so I'll be putting it above Mad Villainy. But again, it's total preference. In a month or a week, I might feel differently. They're really just that interchangeable to me. Released in 2021, Super What is the first and currently the only posthumous release from MF Doom's estate. Super What is also the second collaboration between MF Doom and Zarface. And would you believe that I'm not really that fond of it? Most of my issues with the project are the same as Zarface meets Metal Face, so I won't bother repeating myself too much. But unlike Zarface meets Metal Face, Super What is a significantly shorter project, which I actually think works to the album's benefit since it's not as cluttered as its predecessor. Furthermore, with this album, there isn't really a grandiose theme that the group fails to live up to, as opposed to the unexplored potential of Zarface meets Metal Face. Super What has the benefit of being more laid back and able to sort of exist in its own lane. In terms of the album, I don't really feel Inspector Deck's presence on here too much. I think Esso and Doom definitely stole the show on this project, and that's perfectly fine with me since I don't feel like there's three different people clamoring for the mic this time around. Breaking the Action is definitely one of my favorite tracks off this album, and how couldn't it be with a lyric like Zarface, Wu-Tang, MF Doom Gang? I also really like the ending skit for Doom Onto Others, which features an advertisement for what I thought was a fictitious product, but it turned out to be for a real Zarface collectible figure which has unfortunately been long sold out as of the time of this video's release. I guess I'd place this album on par with Venomous Villain. I don't really like either one of them by a significant enough margin to place one over the other. But if I had to, I'd place Super What over VV2, just because it's a more polished and well-rounded project. The last album that we have is the beloved classic Vaudeville Villain. Released in 2003, Vaudeville features the first appearance of Doom under his alias of Victor Vaughn. This album dropped a few months before a lot of Doom's essential albums, and I think it was a great precursor of great things to come. The production on this album is really unique. It's unlike what you'll find on many other Doom albums, except maybe projects like Key to the Cuffs or certain tracks off Born Like This. I think this distinction in production and the fact that the album is credited under a different moniker really helped to give Vaudeville Villain its own identity. This unique production is brought to us by the likes of Heat Sensor, King Honey, Max Bill, Mr. Ten, and RJD2. You would think that having so many chefs in the kitchen would make this album feel a little inconsistent, but surprisingly, I don't feel it does. It definitely gives the album a different vibe. It's intentionally a little rough around the edges, and it feels like an underground rap album, which is what it technically is. If MF Doom is the superstar getting all the shine, then Victor Vaughn is the low-key underground rapper. My favorite track on this album has to be Can I Watch, featuring a Pawnee B. The way Nicki and Vaughn's verses flow into one another so effortlessly is a wonderful listen. They just have a really good synergy, it's hard not to love this song. And the line on Never Dead, whoever jipped my locker and took my Donkey Kong game, it's one of the funniest Victor Vaughn bars that I've noticed so far. Monster Island Czar's Rodan also kills his feature on the first open mic night. Vaudeville is one of my least listened to Doom albums, and that's intentional, as I like taking my time with the good stuff. There's no sense in chugging fine wine. With that being said, Vaudeville Villain is a great album, and I'd place it in the A tier. And that is my ranking of MF Doom's discography. Remember, if you'd like to share your own ranking on these albums, you can do so with the tier maker link in the description below. If you'd like to do me a huge favor, I'd really appreciate it if you took a few minutes to check out my video on the hidden stories behind the Smith's album covers. Originally, the video was going to come out as soon as this one went live, but I just ran out of time and I didn't want to squander the quality of that video. It won't be out for a few weeks, so just turn on notifications to be reminded. It'll be the very next video I upload, so you can just turn off notifications afterwards. Lastly, I want to thank you all for bearing with me while I took a break from content creation. It's definitely rejuvenated my creative drive. And a special thank you to my contributors here on YouTube and Patreon. Blank Saint, Tad Onchi, Caboose Saibot, Jay Murray, Wingman, Jesse Pigal, Bobby Nova, Neon Rose, Dirty Dan, and a warm welcome to our latest members, Don Did, Dylan Sanders, P. Anya, The Creator, Christian Peterson, and my beloved Conda. Thank you all for your support.